So anyway. So All right, I think we're ready to go ahead and start. Three minutes after 5.30. Anne Fifield, I'm the Economic Strategies Manager at the City of Eugene, and I want to thank you all very much for sharing your evening with us tonight. We are here as part of a process for, that came about of a City Council meeting last May. Council gave staff direction to come up with a process, to implement a process, to identify barriers to housing affordability, availability, and diversity, and to suggest evaluate and recommend possible strategies. I always need notes because it's a mouthful. And tonight is the first of four meetings that are that process. You are the group that are is that process. And um, the meetings, the outcome of these meetings are some recommended actions for city council that will help us address housing affordability for the community. And that's why we're here tonight. Thank you all very much. Just very briefly, I want to introduce a staff person is Jason Diedrich. Jason has really been responsible for the outreach. He's been the primary contact with you all. So thank you very much for all of that complicated and hard work, Jason. And then finally, I want to introduce Mayor Lucy Venice. Thank you. Thank you, Ann and Jason and staff who pulled this together. And thank all of you for committing your time. It's no small thing to commit uh, four evenings, three hours after you've put in a full day of work for most of you. So I really appreciate your commitment to this process and I will be sitting in the back and listening and, and look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I also want to honor the fact that this is a, a, a kind of a mixed group, that there are many familiar faces in this room who have been around the block on housing issues. You know these issues well, you've had these conversations before, you bring a lot of experience and background to this. And in this group, we have also incurred, in, included people who are new to this conversation, for whom this is not familiar territory. They're engaging for the first time. And our hope is that by bringing you together, the folks who have a lot of experience and the folks who represent uh, sectors of our community that haven't been part of this conversation, that together, will distill down some pretty valuable insights and information and direction forward. So I thank all of you. The, the new folks are going to benefit from the experience of the folks who've been around, and the folks who've been around hopefully will benefit from the insights of a few new voices and faces at the table. So thank you very much for committing your energy and your insights and your time, and I am looking forward to hearing the conversation. Well, thank you. It's not every day that I uh, get to facilita facilitate a meeting that the mayor comes and opens, so it's pretty pretty neat for your community to, to have that asset here. Um, my name is Carrie Bennett. I get to be your facilitator over these four meetings. Uh, it is my utter privilege to be here. Uh, I graduated from the U of O uh, a couple years ago and then moved back to Colorado and now live in Laramie, Wyoming. The bad news is it takes me a while to get back here. The good news is uh, I get to, to visit you all and enjoy this community again. The other benefit is that my role as your facilitator is to be very neutral. I don't have a stake in the decisions that you make. I don't own property here. I love you all. I love all of Eugene, um, but I really don't have any, out, um, any stake in the outcomes. Um, so you all can trust that. You can call me out on that if you notice me bending one way or another. Um, but legitimately, it's my job to uh, elevate your level of thinking, to challenge you to think more deeply together, and to help you listen to one another um, so you can come up with the best solutions possible. So that's my role for today. I believe in going slow to go fast. So we're going to spend some time this evening making sure that everybody's on the same page before we jump into the heart of the issue. For many of you who have been working on this stuff for a long time, I know you're antsy to like go, like make the list, send it to council, let's do it already, right? I won't make you raise your hands if that's you, but um, I do want to acknowledge, um, as the mayor said, many of you have been toiling at this work for a long time, and I'd like to think that maybe what started out as a kind of a rocky road, you've been spending years and years kind of tilling and preparing the soil. Any gardeners in the room? 
I can't grow things to save my life, but when I lived in Oregon, I could. <laughs> um, anyway, I wanted to acknowledge that many of you have been tilling and amending that soil um, and planting seeds and everything else, and I'm hoping that um, in part thanks to that hard work, um, the timing is right now that the seeds that we plant um, and the recommendations that you all send to city council will be really fruitful and grow. So just wanted to acknowledge that. So our purpose is um, listed up here. We're gonna think deeply about the challenges of housing affordability in Eugene. I've done my job right if you leave tonight and every meeting going, huh, I never thought about that before, especially you really experienced folks. Um, and then based on that, we're gonna generate a list of ideas and actions that the city can take, to, can take to improve those issues. We have four meetings scheduled. This one is focused on training, relationship building. That does not mean kumbaya. We are not doing icebreakers, okay? If you want that, stay afterwards. We'll hold hands and do it. But um, it's mostly just helping you get to know one another and being assets to one another in the community. And uh, many of you already know one another, um, but you'll have a chance to work in small groups and, and have thoughtful conversations. And then the bulk of it is um, this problem solving piece and talking about the story of what this challenge looks like. I'm gonna leave the other ones, um, but we'll preview them before we leave today. Our agenda is here. We're gonna make sure that everybody is on the same page and feels welcomed. We're gonna talk about wicked problems, which might be a new concept to some of you, but let me tell y'all, housing affordability is a wicked problem. That doesn't mean it's wicked because it's evil. <laughs> it's wicked because it's hard to solve, right? And it's inherently complex. We'll talk more about what that means. Sorry about the poll. If I go this way. <laughs> um, we will talk about a collaborative decision-making um, pro process. Um, and the decision-making rules that we'll use in this group. How many of you were involved way back in the day with planning efforts with Bob Chadwick? One, two, huh? Bob Chadwick is my, my Yoda. I am the Luke Skywalker version. And our tools that we'll use, um, many of them have come from Bob's work um, and my mentor that, that learned under Bob. So I hope that's good. We'll see. Um, I really admire his work. So um, then we'll jump into the story, talking about who's affected and how, some of the broader impacts of um, housing affordability if it doesn't impact you directly. Some of these issues we won't get into right away. Um, we might have to hold on to some of them until October, and that's okay. And then we'll wrap up. We will be done by 8.30. I have a one-year-old who will be hopefully asleep by then, um, but I've, I've learned I don't work late now that I have a one-year-old. So. We'll be doing that. Um, let's go ahead and preview in your handbooks. You all received a copy of those. On page five, there is an overview of the purpose. We are one piece of information that'll be pouring information back to city council. And your piece, I think that they will be hopefully acting on um, in their December meeting. There are other pieces that will continue in the spring and some of this work will be ongoing, but wanted to draw your attention to that piece. Go ahead and flip. I know you just started reading the details. Flip to page six and take a second individually just to read through the uh, group member expectations and preview those so we're all on the same page. And whenever you're ready, go ahead and turn to somebody at your table. If there's three of you, just make it a group of three. If there's two, just talk to the person immediately next to you. Um, anything that stands out from that or, or uh, questions that you have, just talk real quick about um, what you read there with your um, seatmates, and I'll bring us back together in just about two minutes.
And when you're ready, just turn back this way. Y'all are so good. It's the first day. By the fourth day, when I'm trying to get your, inv your attention back, you're going to be so busy talking. Be like, no, we're not done yet. <laughs> you're so well behaved on the first day. I love it. Um, any questions before we jump in um, about those expectations and, and what we need from you all to get the best out of this? All right. Um, I'm going to add a couple other expectations. Um, these ones with the stars are the ones that are on that list. I thought of a couple others that I just want to make sure we draw attention to. One here is balanced participation, that idea of sharing the airspace. A lot of you have tremendous expertise, and we are so glad, and we want you to pour that into the room. And we want to make sure that there's vo um, space for the quieter voices, right, and that we, that we hear their voices too. So just be mindful of that. And then this last one, make sure you take care of yourself. We will have breaks, um, but if you need to get up and use the restroom, if you just don't like to sit this long, feel free to stand up, you know, just stand around the edges or something, um, and, and please just take care of yourself that way. Good? If these are agreements we can live with, show your agreement by giving me a thumbs up. Here are your other options. If you feel so-so and want to talk about it a little more, this is training for later. Um, you're going to vote with your thumb this way. And if you really have major issues with it, I hope you don't at this point on this issue, um, you can voice your, uh, your feelings this way, and I will make sure to call on you so we can, can fix some things and get the ideas in the room. What I saw in the quick scan is we're good on the expectations and can go along. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, one other note I, I forgot to mention. We have a, a community volunteer who is um, taping tonight's work that, to share for folks who weren't able to attend in person. Um, if you have severe concerns and are, are worried about that, um, feel free to visit with Jason, who's sitting in the back, um, and, and he can help you work something out. You're just going to be taped on the back of your head, and it's I'm glad I showered yesterday because it's mostly, I think, going to be me there. <laughs> um, but, but we do want to make sure that folks are comfortable with that so we can get information out. All right. Um, with that, let's go ahead and check in. We are going to do this quickly. And just with our stakeholder folks, audience folk, we'll, we'll check in in a different way with you. I uh, want you to introduce who you are, so your name. If you have an affiliation, if you're representing a neighborhood group or a builders association or a housing advocacy group or whatever else. Some of you are pure residents who care, um, and that's awesome. You can, you can just be a resident who cares, and that's fantastic. Um, and then if you would share what you're missing tonight so you can be here. I'm missing putting my one-year-old to bed. You're worth it. I put him to bed a lot. <laughs> um, but share what it is that you're missing tonight um, to be here, and we can uh, honor that. Real brief, because there's a bunch of us. Um, if somebody would like to begin, I will pass the mic, and we'll go from there. Deborah, thank you. I'm Deborah Daly, and I am the homeless student liaison for Eugene Forte School District. I'm missing supper with my partner of 45 years. Wow. Go ahead and go that way. Um, my name is Isaac Judd, and I'm with the Eugene Realtors and the uh, Housing Policy Board, and I'm just seeing um, dinner with the family. Betsy Schultz, Government Affairs Director for the Eugene Association of uh, Realtors, and uh, I'm just seeing whiskey in the Wall Street Journal, probably. <laughs> dinner sounded good, but whiskey sounds better. <laughs> Mel Bankoff, I'm a developer, and I also run a nonprofit teaching youth about sustainability, sustainability and advocacy. And I'm um, here, I'm not missing anything. I'm Terry Harding, I'm a staff member with the City of Eugene Planning Department and a Eugenian for 23 years. Um, I am missing an ice cream social at my kids' middle school. <coughs> Karen Knudsen, architect, and I run a sustainable design practice, and I'm also the project lead for the Better Housing Together effort, which is a collection of community groups and organizations that have been working to think about some of these issues over um, almost this past year. So uh, I also have two young children, so I'm missing the arguments that went right before dinner, uh, oh, <laughs> leading, and then dinner time. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Jacob Fox. I'm the Executive Director of the Homes for Good Housing Agency. Uh, so we provide a home to 4,600 people across Lane County and we do a, a lot of real estate development, uh, new affordable housing. 
I'm delaying a drive to Newport because I have a meeting there uh, first thing tomorrow morning, so I'll be driving down <coughs> after this meeting. I'm Eliza Kaczynski. I'm with the Walk Green Street Citizen Advisory Network, and I'm also on the Budget Committee, and I'm a senior with my husband, also, but not of 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amy Walsh, and I'm on the Human Rights Commission, and I'm missing a late night at the office. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can say you're welcome. Or <laughs> I'm Claudia Orozco, and I represent the Latino Network here in Eugene. I also am a resident. Uh, I've been for three years, um, currently a hunter, so there's a lot of concerns and just happy to be here and I'm missing my little one-year-old as well oh, and, my, <laughs> and my two sisters that just came in to live with me from my eco so. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. My name is Roman Anderson. I'm representing Kimball Construction. We're a general contractor and we build homes and commercial buildings. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything. I'm happy to be here and happy to participate. I'm, I'm Miranda and I'm the Executive Director of NEDCO. We're a nonprofit here in town that does uh, affordable housing development and community economic development. Our development role is mostly affordable housing for home ownership, first time low income home buyers, uh, but we also do a little bit of rental development as well. I'm an amateur hard cider maker and I have Ooh. baskets of apples all over my house, so <laughs> they are going to be mocking me when I get home that I didn't do anything with them. <laughs> I'm John Van Leningham. I work as a lawyer, lawyer for something called Lane County Legal Aid. It's a free civil legal service for low-income people. I specialize in my tenant law and affordable housing advocacy. And I've, for 40 years, I've done advocacy on both issues here and in Salem. Oh. I'm not missing cider. Um, I'm missing work. <laughs> I am Amy Bradbury. I'm a staff person with the City of Eugene Building and Permit Services, and I just missed out on a dog box. So I'm pretty fat. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Fragla. I'm a second grade teacher at Adams Elementary in Eugene, and I'm also a recently appointed member of the City of Eugene Planning Commission. And I'm missing having ice cream with my family. My name is Norton Cavill. I chair the Intergovernmental Housing Policy Board. Our mission is to encourage the development of affordable housing. I'm glad to be here. Hi, uh, my name is David Saez. I'm the executive director at Centro <coughs> Latino Americano, and uh, we help uh, families and individuals seek out housing. Um, so that's our one of our roles. And I am missing uh, dinner with my family. So. I'm Carolyn Jacobs. I'm one of the three Neighborhood Leaders Council representatives here tonight. Um, can't say that I'm really missing anything. There's a meeting every single night this week. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get so lucky? <laughs> I'm Dick Goodman, and I'm also uh, one of the NLC reps and the chair of Jefferson Westside Neighbors. And it's poker night. So. Oh. But if we get done on time, I might be able to make it in. So. Solid. Thanks. I'm Pat Hawken. Um, I'm here representing the League of Women Voters that has a, had an interest in housing for many, many years. And um, I am missing sitting on my patio with my husband. My name is Alyssa Powell. I'm the Digital Media Marketing Specialist for Palo Alto Software. Uh, I'm just a general resident, but also representing the young professional community, and I'm also missing my 15-month-old uh, bedtime routine, but I know my husband is having a wonderful time with her. <laughs> I'm Ann Delaney. I'm an architect here in town, and I've done a fair amount of housing, uh, affordable housing, over the years. Um, and what I'm missing, I guess, is a lovely dinner at home with my husband and cat. I'm Ty Bruce Zimmerman. I'm the co-chair of the Active Bethel Citizens Neighborhood Association and a member of the Eugene Budget Committee. And I'm missing cooking my wife dinner, which means she's probably just eating ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> They're the worst problems to have, I'm just gonna say. Thank you. I'm Chris Parra, Superintendent Bethel School District, and I am missing an opportunity to work more on behalf of Bethel. I'm Susan Bam. I work at a nonprofit that puts people in housing, especially folks with special needs, all very low income. And I would be on <coughs> cooking dinner right now. <laughs> I, mean, I 
last but not least, we've got our table of closers. I'm Ron DeVert. I'm on the Sheena Neighborhood Board, and I'm one of the NLC representatives here tonight. And I'm not missing much of anything uh, being at home. It's more exciting being here. <laughs> I'm Dan Hill. I'm a, a local architect, builder, and developer. I uh, have been here for 40 years now uh, doing that type of work in the community. Um, and what am I missing? I'm missing paying bills at the office tonight. And, <laughs> and my back is missing my hot tub. So. Oh. <laughs> Ed McMahon. I'm proud to be the executive director of the Home Builders Association for 21 years now. And I'm missing Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> By our powers combined, we can have hard cider, whiskey, hot tubs, ice cream, and whole <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. Let's just check in uh, visually with our audience members. We have some folks from the city staff. If you are employed by the city of Eugene and here because you just can't get enough and want to be here listening to the important stuff, go ahead and raise your hand for us. Woohoo! Thanks for being here. These folks are here as a resource and we can pepper them with questions when we don't know something and we think they do. <laughs> um, other folks that are residents of Eugene and here because they care. Awesome. Perfect. And other folks who live outside of Eugene. Anybody else? Fantastic. Awesome. I always love when people come from outside a community. Sometimes it's a commuter who says, I want to live there, but I can't afford to, so I'm living way down the road. And other times it's some other reason. I'm an outsider too. Welcome. Um, awesome. Thanks for doing that check-in. Um, it helps just to get all of our voices in the room um, and to recognize all the things that we have in common, um, even if later on we discover we have some differences, which is to be expected. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump in now with... I had to double check my notes. Oh, audience expectations. I checked in with y'all. There's a list of them over there and you probably got a handout. Your job is to support us doing our best thinking, which means don't be a distraction. <laughs> and when you have brilliant ideas, share them through the channels that the city has set up. Um, and we will definitely share those with the larger group when we come back again. So appreciate that. Um, all right, let's talk about wicked problems. This is going to be the 10-minute uh, version of what could be an entire graduate course. <laughs> um, but wicked problems um, are, by definition, difficult to solve. Um, they're complex and have a lot of interrelated variables. I like to call them whack-a-mole problems or like Pillsbury Doughboy problems, where if you push in one place, it creates a problem somewhere else. Right? So there, there are situations where you can't just come up with a te technical solution that solves it, but instead you're, you're having to balance competing needs and interests and knowing that there is no perfect solution. Right? So they're, they're tricky because of that, um, because we don't like those unintended consequences, because those other unintended, conse unintended consequences affect people. Um, and, and we're problem solvers, right? We like it when we can solve something and it's done, and wicked problems really resist that, okay? Um, the, the last part there, wicked problems are often polarizing because people prioritize things differently. As I give you an example, you might be able to see, oh yeah, that's where this one thing is really important to me, and I care about that other stuff too, but this one thing is really important. And we sometimes get into really heated battles because they, these uh, competing values are so important to us. So one example of that, before we jump into housing, I live in uh, Wyoming, but really the problems are, I think, the worst in Colorado on this. Um, I'm just going to set the microphone down for a sec here. Thank you. Appreciate it. So water, oh. We survived a rainstorm, this pad of paper and I, today. In Wyoming, we deal with wind. <laughs> it's a different problem with paper. So water is, is one example of a wicked problem. It's a scarce resource, right? And people want to put it towards agriculture. They want to put it towards landscaping and making parks and lawns and things pretty. They want to put it towards recreation. That's me drawing a boat. <laughs> It's a raft, you can tell, right? Um, we need industry and energy, right? And water gets put towards those things. We need it for drinking, we need it for wildlife. There's a bunch of other things that could come up here, right? When it comes down to it, there's only so much water out there. 
right? And we all need it for all of these things. How many of you looking up here can pick what your most important priority would be? And then maybe your least important priority, right? So it's easy to say, well, clearly um, we need food, so this is what's most important. And recreation, well, that's just for fun. So all those boaters be darned because I'm more important, right? And the recreation people can have that same perspective to say, what do we live here for if it's not all this good stuff with recreation and fishing and all of that stuff? It's really the, the green grass growers that are the problem, right? And we can very quickly kind of pigeonhole one another and be angry with one another. But ultimately, all of these things have a need, have a purpose, are important to some people, and we have that tension and the, and the push and pull from that. Think now for an example, or for a minute, about housing. I have two examples up there. We want a strong economy, and we want affordability, affordable prices, and, and so folks can access, right? I'll give you a hint. One way to solve the affordable housing problem, let your economy tank. <laughs> Detroit was really affordable a ways back, right? Stuff was super affordable because this wasn't there, right? So these two are, are in tension with one another because as your economy is strong and you have a wonderful, desirable place to live, it puts pressure here and prices go up, right? So this is one place where we all want a strong economy and we all want, all want affordable access, but more of one sometimes has a consequence for the other. Have a quick conversation at your table. What are some of the other things that are hard? And it's different than water. This was about kind of where we put resources. Think about for housing, what are the other things that we really want and that are really important to us, or important to some of us anyway, that maybe put pressure on another part of the equation? What are some other things where you see there's trade-offs around, around housing? Okay, quick conversation at your table. You can do pairs or all four of you or three of you together, um, but, but see if you can come up with what are some of those other pieces that make it hard to solve this problem. Go ahead and go. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. I think that we were in a meeting once. Yeah, I thought that was you. Nice to see you. <laughs> All right, start wrapping up that conversation. Let's get the wisdom of the room up in front where everyone can see it. Tell me about some of the pieces that you came up with. There's going to be a whole bunch of them. It may get real messy, but that's probably appropriate. Um, any ideas that came from your group? Go ahead, Ted. Uh, low wages. Low wages and, and being fair wages and adequate pay. And the problem is that, you, that wages haven't caught, uh, kept up with um, construction costs. Got it. And so it's hard for people to afford it, um, but they should be able to afford it if wages were where they should be. Got it, got it. So there's the entire labor market, which is one piece of it for, for everybody, but then there's also the impact of wages and construction, right? And that we want people to be paid fairly, we want them to be paid well, it's competitive, attracting and recruiting good people, which then drives up the price of construction, which drives up the price of the in-house good. So both sides of that. Excellent, thank you. Others here? talked about existing homeowners dealing with change as it relates to density and also land use structure. Good. So people like um, kind of consistency and tradition. I grew up on a small farm and the, the property around it started getting developed when I was a kid and I remember thinking, that can't happen, right? That's our horse field. It wasn't our horse field, it was somebody else's, right? But there's this, this wish that we have for consistency, for tradition, for how things have been, um, and that has an impact on, what's kind of the flip side of that? Um, was it density, or? Well, we talked about density and also land use. Land use, okay. So there's a piece of that that, um, I think, what is it that we want? With density, it's really about efficiency, right? There's ways that we can, we want to be efficient with the land that we have, and so density is one possible way to be efficient. Well, thank you for what I'm talking about, like having walkable neighborhoods, so having markets and restaurants that were within a quarter of a mile, single family homes. Good, so we want walkability. Um, okay, so the, the land use implications of that, good. Um, a couple of 
couple other things that we might want that density could potentially benefit mm -hmm. are uh, environmental factors like cleaner air, as well as uh, better traffic, okay. <laughs> less traffic. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say we want low traffic. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we want low traffic, which is connected to the walkability, right? How far you have to go. Um, and then is also connected to clean air if people are having to commute in a long way for work. Okay, good. There's something still with the, with the density I'm thinking we need to capture, but I'm not sure how to do it yet. I'm just gonna make an observation. I've only heard from men so far. Ladies, don't be shy. <laughs> we have a microphone for people. Oh, I think Chelsea will bring it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Alex oh. says, no, no, no microphone. <laughs> I think we talked a little about the consistency in the context of what are we preserving. Are we preserving sort of the existing built environment? Are we preserving natural areas? Okay, good. So there's um, consistency and tradition with architecture or the feel of a neighborhood or something, but it also might be um, open space or resources. Yeah. Good. So I'm going to say open space, green space. I mean, what she also said was farms, and so we want farms, forests. Uh, in the value for is that right? Did I get that right? Okay, farms and forests, right? We uh, Oregon kind of leads the nation in having really strict urban growth boundaries and taking that seriously. You can't just sprawl, come to Colorado, it's real ugly. <laughs> um, but it has an impact. The communities that have imposed urban growth boundaries then see their property values skyrocket because there's only so many places to go. Good. So we value that open space, the green space, farms and forests, etc. Other ideas? Yeah. We came up with bureaucracy, especially pertaining to urban growth boundary expansion. Uh huh. So the um, the bureaucracy, the kind of the, the limitations on growth and the regulations that go along with that. Good. So those regulations are there. Um, some would argue for a really important reason of preserving the consistency of keeping people safe of the open space, whatever, whatever, and that regulation then. Uh, has a, a negative effect and impacts impacts the affordability. Uh, the affordability. Definitely good. Others, yeah. Just in general and just aesthetics. You know, just how a place feels. And you know, if there's new construction, what's it going to look like? Good. Good. So just beauty. Yeah. Right? Sort of like our downtown development. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we we want things to be beautiful. Uh, and, and there's a trade out there. It could be with affordability. It might cost more, right? Um, it might be that the, the places that are available are, haven't been developed because they're more expensive. Something with the land or location or something else is very expensive. Um, and, and to make it beautiful would be hard. Yeah. Does, does consistency mean resistance to change? Um, I think that tradition may be, um, there's something about that that's the continuity and consistency. Um, I guess the, the kind of shadow side of that could be resistance to change. But I think about this as when I look at a wicked problem mapped this way, I want to be able to say, yeah, all of this stuff's important, right? I might prioritize one thing over another, and you might feel opposite. But ultimately, these are things that we can look at and say, yeah, I get where that person is coming from, and I get what, what that is. So um, I guess that's why I'm trying to phrase them all as positives. What, what were you thinking about with the resistance to change, though? Is there something that we're missing up here that's that's embedded in that when people are resisting change? Is there a piece that... If we're going to change the housing mix, or, you know, increase housing, mm -hmm. that inevitably means there will be changes. Yep. And change is nice. Yeah, change, is, change can be really hard. Yeah, so I, th I think that's captured here with the consistency and tradition. But think about it, if that's, if that's something that's really important to you, if there's something we haven't captured um, that explains why it, it can be so hard to see those things change. Um, because that's, that's a, a very human thing that's hard, but if there's another angle, let me know. Good. Anything else? Ed's got one on the tip of his tongue. It, it seems to me like we ought to put it out on the table. I think what we're talking about is then be not in my backyard. Ah, yeah. yeah, so let's think about that because NIMBY itself and the not in, my, not in my backyard that we all feel about certain things at certain times. Um, what is that about for people? What is it when, um, God, I can tell you funny, funny stories of other projects when people have gotten really fired up about not wanting something in their backyard. Uh, but what is it? What is motivating that? Because it's not just consistency. Is it about safety? Is it about? I'm sure. 
Fear? Yeah, so what is it that we want? The alternative of fear is? Predictability. Safety. 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 All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it safety. And so for some people, just change in general gives them anxiety and they don't feel safe, right? In other, in other cases, neighborhoods evolve and change. Um, in, in some communities, that's who's moving in gives people great anxiety, right? And that's hard. So, so people want safety. Well, I can look at that and say, yeah, we all want safety, right? But let's talk about what that means then. Um, I saw a hand, go ahead. I don't exactly know how to express this, but it's something about choice or a variety of housing types. Yeah, we value choices. That we have freedom, that there's a variety, that there's a, a, a menu of options out there, and we appreciate that, and the freedom to choose. You're not just pegged. Think about like Soviet-style block homes, like everybody can have a house and it's affordable. <laughs> right? There's some trade-offs there. Uh, comment there? Um, a couple of the issues that came up at our table, I think, spoke to equity issues. Mm, tell me more. So um, somebody mentioned gentrification. Um, I think that one of the issues that I've become aware of through having conversations around this topic is the generational divide and distribution of wealth and opportunity and how young people in our community often have a very different perspective than older people in our community. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about this around issues of equity, um, also around diverse communities, um, equity is certainly I think a lot of us would place value on, but we also, when we, like, when do we stop valuing it, I think, in comparison to these other ideas is an important question. Good, definitely, definitely. Um, so I captured up here equity and how uh, people are able to access this resource, whether they think of it as, as simply a place to live or as an investment or whatever else, um, and then the, the way that diversity intersects with that. Right. It's really easy to say we want diverse communities, right? But then how does that play with some of the other tensions and priorities people have? Okay, good, excellent, this is good. I was brainstorming this in case you all struggled and I did not come up with all, all these ideas, good job. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say sustainability and I'm looking at you know materials of construction, energy efficiencies and those components, how that plays into the uh, process of construction. Good. So we want clean air, clean water, the green space, all of that, all the sustainability issues are in there, and there could be costs, right, in the long run. You could make the case, right, but, but in the short term, it doesn't cost more or not. There's a, a trend tension there. Go ahead. Uh, what about missing opportunities for new businesses to come and settle their roots here? Uh-huh. So um, kind of growth, and we think about that of um, kind of new business, new residents, um, the opportunity for, for folks to come and make a space here. Good. Again, trade off with that changes the neighborhood, that puts different, different pressures on other stuff, but it's important in cities that aren't growing or struggling, right? Good. Another one? So another angle on the growth thing is the fact that we're, we are an incredibly attractive place for people wanting to move here, and especially from places to the north and to the south. Um, and those are often places where real estate, et cetera, is much more expensive. And they come here and what we think of as like extreme, extremely expensive stuff. Right. It looks cheap. And so right. That really plays with our Absolutely. Our Absolutely. So in having this wonderful quality of life, huh, shoot, <laughs> everyone wants to be here. If you would just dirty things up a whole bunch. Don't, we tell everybody in Laramie, don't tell anybody it's awesome here. So far, they haven't figured it out because it's teeny tiny. <laughs> Good. Other is that a hand? Yeah. yeah um, this may not be the best words to describe it, but I guess I'd say vertical integration. So if someone's in affordable housing, is there opportunities for them to move up into market rate housing? Mm -hmm. If someone's a homeowner in market rate housing and they lose money or go on a fixed income, is there opportunities for them to access an affordable option? Can I call it individual mobility? Sure. I don't know if that's right, but 
By the way, if you know spelling mistakes, because there will be plenty of them, come tell me later. I'll be perfect one day in the end. Until then, you have to just put up with me, and there's going to be plenty. So vertical mobility, individual mobility, that you can you can progress right um, from different experiences with your housing and, and uh, become ever more secure with it. Go ahead. Um, I think one thing people want is control. Yeah. So <laughs> along with choice, to, they want to be able to kind of determine what's going on around them. Good. So if you're really vulnerable in your housing situation and, and either because it's financial or you're renting and you don't know if you're going to be able to stay in that place, there's a lot of different ways that you could lose control. Is it so some, there's another flavor you're thinking? Um, I was thinking when we were talking about like sort of the consistency and the tradition. Got it. He's about people wanting to be able to make the decisions that affect their community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they bought their property, they feel that sense of ownership and what they bought into or have moved into or whatever else and feeling a sense of control. That makes sense. Thank you. Good. Isn't it interesting how something like control or safety, that word that we can be like, oh yeah, but that might even mean something very different. Gun control is another wicked problem. And I think about safety with that. Right? For some people, safety is having a gun in their hand, and for some people, safety is no guns, right? And that we all want safety, but we get it in such different ways. Good, good, excellent. Um, let's leave it here for now. Can, could you just give yourselves a hand? Because this is a really good job. <laughs> Humor me, you did a good job. All right. Um, let's, we're going to do one more quick activity before we take a break. Um, we will leave this and, and refer back to it being mindful of none of these i'm just going to venture to say none of these by themselves are bad things right we can all agree that choice is important we can all agree that green space is important now some of you again might prioritize one of those over another how many of you already have your favorite if you one this one i know you want lots of them um we'll see the ways that those tensions pull on one another as we go and we'll refer back to this and we can certainly add to them but the concept is there of how what more of one might mean less of another and how we our job is to find the balance that works for the city of eugene all right um next task on our agenda and then we were going to take a quick break i want to make sure that we're all clear about how we're going to talk about the problem and how we're going to make decisions to know when we're done. So let's start with how we're going to talk about the problem. In your handbook, ooh, you are so helpful. You're already turned to the right page. Page seven um, and page eight, if you want to see the details, gives you a map of the collaborative problem solving cycle. Bob Chadwick would have called it interest based problem solving. Go ahead and take a preview there. These are the steps that we'll follow in working through the challenge of housing affordability. All right, I see a lot of people staring at me, which tells me you're mostly done. <laughs> if you're still reading, keep going. Um, just off the top of your head, are there any questions in terms of kind of these steps that we're gonna work through? All right, oftentimes when I'm working with groups, it's gonna be a longer term effort or it's a group that's going to stick together and keep working on stuff. So we spend more time training them on this cycle. Um, you can use this cycle for everything. Uh, I have used it with elementary school teachers and playground conflict. That's between the teachers and supervising the playground, not the kids. <laughs> um, I've used this for uh, labor contracts and doing collaborative uh, negotiations in, in labor disputes. Um, I have used it on my husband <laughs> about washing dishes. <laughs> and he says, are you doing that thing? <laughs> um, so anyway, this is a resource for you, but I'm not going to spend a bunch of time training you to do it independently. We're just going to follow these steps. And if you get real excited about it, we can talk more about it later. So in that cycle, um, you see the, the first First part of it is the story. That's what we're going to spend most of our time on today, is just talking about what is this problem, how do we understand it from a lot of different angles. That's going to continue in our October meeting, and in October we're also going to identify what our interests are as we think of, of possible solutions, what are the things that are motivating us and are important to us in any possible solution, and then being really creative really, really creative because it's a hard problem. What are all the ways that we might solve the problem? Okay, so at that point, it's all just broadening pie in the sky, all the possibilities, getting as concrete as possible, all of the things that we might do. November meetings, um, 
is when we're going to get into the, the, what I think is a little bit harder work of deliberating and weighing those options. So at this point, we're all staying super open-minded. We're understanding one another. We're understanding what's important to one another. We're being super creative and generating those options. When we get into November, we have to really put our thinking hats on and we'll do our straw design then of putting together different options, evaluating them. Um, there will be the housing economist that the city is, is working with. The housing economist will send information directly to city council with their recommendations as far as the effectiveness of some of these things. But that person is also going to come here for these two meetings and help us talk through what some of the data might say um, to help us understand what those options are. So that'll be some expertise in the room. You can decide to take that advice or not, right? Um, in, in the way that you weigh the decisions and the list that goes to city council. And then at our last meeting, we'll finish up our problem solving um, and hopefully draft up those agreements. So if you're a planner a header, because many of you are, um, that's roughly, you could fill in those dates next to those phases. Let's put this here. Here's the end product, and this is gonna get us into how we're gonna make decisions. At that November meeting, probably won't be this piece of paper because it's gonna be a lot bigger. Um, we will try to identify from all of those options after really thinking through everything, what are the things that we can come to unanimous agreement about? And we can put on a list and say, hey, city council, you need to do this stuff. And 100% of the people in this room can give it thumbs up and say, yeah, that's smart, let's do it. I hope it's a big list. I have my fingers crossed. Some groups say they have all of their agreements have to meet this threshold. I don't think that's realistic that, that we're gonna get all of our things to that level, but I'm hoping we do come up with a list of things that, that, that all of us can agree to. There will be other things that maybe all but one, two, maybe three people can agree to. In my mind, um, that's how I would define consensus in a group this large, and we'll read more about what consensus means. For those things, we will list them out and then explain the positives and negatives um, and, and let city council then be able to weigh what that opposition means, right? It might just be that one group is prioritizing one aspect of this over another, right? And city council will take that and have to say, huh, all right, so what's best as they're making decisions for the broad city? Um, are we okay with a little more of one of these to have a little less of another one, okay? Um, partial agreement is anything between like 50 and 85% of us. And again, we'll list what those things are. And then there will be a bunch of things that will be considered but not have enough agreement, that less than half of us think it's a good idea. And we'll, we'll give them that list. It could be the housing economist is like, best idea ever. And you guys will say, hmm, less than half of us agree, right? And, and city council will get to decide what to do with that. All right, any questions about that end product? All right, so before we get to the, the nitty gritty of that, I want you to read a little bit more about what consensus looks like and what we're working towards. I think it's gonna be page nine. Is there something on there about consensus? Oh no, page nine is decision-making rules. <laughs> we don't need to get into the philosophy of those, but we're, we're working roughly on the bottom. Um, one of those, the fourth, the fourth one that is unanimous agreement or consensus of some form or another. Although we ultimately are gonna give our information back to city council and they are gonna make the decision, which makes it kind of a type two decision, the second one now. We don't need the, the nuance, don't worry about it. Go on to the next page, page 10. And there's an explanation of what consensus means, what it doesn't mean, because that word gets thrown around a lot. I get to give you my definition today and that's what we're working from. Go ahead and read that and the, and the next page as well if you like. This is where I get to see just how big a can of worms I've opened up. <laughs> Any questions that folks have after kind of reading this definition of consensus and these kind of thresholds? Any questions that folks have? Yeah, good. So, so Ed brought up a question. One of the bullets in there says that, um, can I peek off of this? Sorry. <laughs> challenges sitting in the front row. Why do you um, agree to go along with something if you disagree with it? Yeah, good, good. So the second to last bullet, uh, anybody else have a, a red flag on that? Those who continue to disagree will see the will of the group and indicate they're willing to go along or try a solution for a period of time. 
consider balancing ways to monitor blah, 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 right? Oh, yeah, there. So if you keep going onto the temperature check thing, well, if you see the thumbs, if you, if you still feel kind of so-so about a solution, I fully expect you to say, I feel kind of so-so about it, right? And that's okay, right? Um, if you feel really negatively about something that like, oh, this really, there are serious problems in, with it, I expect you to show me that. Right? So this isn't just go along to get along, right? This is, you know, hold hold your ground in that you don't have to surrender your beliefs and what's important to you and, and everything else. And if there's ways that we can improve upon an idea that makes you go from here to here, or from feeling so-so to like, yeah, I can support that, right? Then we want to do that, right? We want to participate in good faith to say, oh, okay, I hadn't thought about it that way, or that maybe wasn't my first preference, but I can see why that makes sense, right? So there's a willingness to, to engage with an open mind, right? If you just still can't handle it, that's okay, right? And, and we expect you to, to participate in that way. So it's, it's balancing keeping an open mind to consider alternatives, um, to, to weigh the options and, and to be willing to be moved. But if it's just still not an idea you can live with, that's okay, you can register that. Good, thanks for, for asking that clarification. Yes? One thing that came up for us at the table is that endpoint, the degree of, when we, we're gonna make decisions or recommendations of that stuff, mm -hmm. the degree of specificity. Uh, so are we talking, Nobody freak out. I'm not saying anything about it, but for like, for example, urban growth boundary. Uh -huh. So people be like, we need to move that urban growth boundary, or we need to expand it where they've expanded for like, you know, commercial and parts or whatever. We need to mm -hmm. include housing, mm -hmm. that level, or are we talking about, you know, lot. The density, devils are in the details, I mean, right? Where are we at? Where, totally, where, 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 totally. where are we going? So um, it depends, <laughs> and the more specific it is the more likely it's going to be actionable and make any sort of difference, right? So I know that you have the, what's it, Envision Eugene, you have all of the pillars from that. Housing affordability is a key part of that, and actionable stuff based on that value has been difficult to achieve, right? So that's a place where everybody agreed in concept, but then in the nuts and bolts, it's really hard. So our goal at this meeting, somebody from the city, please correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> is to get as specific as possible with things that can make a difference. And realistically, in four meetings, it's gonna be hard to drill down. If something with moving the urban growth boundary, for example, comes up, we're not gonna be able to define exactly in what place, you know, where that would specifically be moved. However, the more specific we can get and still have agreement, the, the better off it'll be. So. I don't, that's probably really unsatisfying. <laughs> but we'll be as, as clear as we can in massaging details, and, and the, the proposal on the table will be clear before I ask you to kind of weigh in, right? So you'll have done a lot of thinking and um, wrestling with an idea before you before you have to weigh in on it. Okay, good. Um, could you give an example of a criteria? Yeah, uh, that's always the stickiest one. So um, sometimes the, the typical criteria that groups come up with in addition to all of their interests, they want to meet as many interests as possible, is it has to be legal. Every once in a while, people come up with some hairball idea and then legal counsel is like, mm, no. <laughs> so legal is usually one. Um, another one is that, it, that it's going to make an improvement, right? So, so people say, well, why are we spending all this time if it's just going to continue status quo, right? So they'll say it has to, has to be impactful in some way and can weigh the, the impactfulness of things. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things they come up with. Often that's a very short list plus meeting as many interests as possible. So if, if there's any other like look for stuff that you really want to see, um, kind of as a, a strainer to catch the best ideas, um, that's where you would identify them. It often ends up being a really short list. I've thought about crossing out criteria entirely and just leaving it with the interests. Most of us have an interest in keeping things legal, so that could just fit there. Anyway, other questions? Thank you for asking that. <laughs> One thing that resonated with me that really stood out is it talks about interests and not necessarily positions mm -hmm. or outcomes. And yeah. so focusing on 
you know, we're all in the same room and we all have the same interest to provide better access to housing. And we may have different positions, but as long as we focus on our interests, Absolutely. It's much more productive. Absolutely. So that's very much at the heart of the way that we'll work through this. And it'll be tricky for people when they're brainstorming options, because some of them, they might be like, ah, that doesn't meet my interest, but it's meeting somebody else's. And part of that is the heart of coming together as a community and saying, all right, how can we help one another out so we can all get more of what's important to us? But you're right, focusing on our interests is going to be the real key to help us, help us come up with good solutions. Good. In the end, we're going to have outcomes that are going to be positions, but we're not going to get there until November. <laughs> so, good. Any other questions? All right. I'd like you to look at the people sitting next to you and repeat after me. Say, wow. Wow. If it were for you, were for you. I'd be the smartest person in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have we have been you don't realize this but we have been living a modern miracle and we are in fact several minutes ahead of schedule <sighs> I did not think that was gonna happen um, so let's take though until 655 I mean All right, let's come on back. We're already starting the slide into anarchy. I said come on back like three times and people are off in the bathroom. I'm just teasing. It's okay. You're not throwing things. We're doing good. <laughs> Save that for November. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, all right. We are on track, even in fact, two minutes early, um, and going to jump in now with the, the heart of things of what is this problem that we're looking at, um, who's it affecting and how, um, and helping wrap our brain around this. Some of you have tremendous knowledge and expertise, either firsthand or through people you work with, of what this challenge of housing affordability looks like. Um, others of you um, are going to be in listening mode for this first phase and you're going to chime in more later. That's fine. Okay. This first round of it, we're going to do it as a whole group and then we're going to mix it up later on to tell the story. But this first chunk, we want to know who's affected and how. When we think about housing affordability, and I, I did want to clarify, this isn't, this isn't just um, affordable housing and thinking of subsidized housing and, and for especially low income folks. Um, this is the bigger picture of uh, all people at all income levels um, being able to access and pay for housing whether they're renting or owning. Okay, so just wanted to call that out. Um, let's talk about that. Let's, let's wrap our heads around the problem. Um, and this is where uh, I'm gonna set the microphone down and try and just be really loud because I'm gonna be chart writing like mad and I don't think this is gonna work down my dress as a make makeshift holder. So uh, I'm gonna, I'll be really loud and if you can't hear, please um, ask me to repeat something and I'll pick up the microphone to do it, okay? Uh, let's jump in. Tell me about this problem. Who's being affected? How big is it? What does it look like? Let's go. Home buyers. First time home buyers. Tell me more about why first time home buyers are seeing a problem out of the market. Okay, so it's hard for first time home buyers. Can you tell me more about that? For every $1,000 increase in housing costs, 266 families are priced out of buying their first home. Ooh, look at the statistics that roll off Ed's tongue. <laughs> For every, say it again, for, for every, every $1,000 increase in housing cost, <coughs> these are 2016 figures, by the way, it'd be higher now, 266 families in the Eugene Springfield area are priced out of buying their first home. And that's assuming that every family in the market is trying to buy that home. Mm -hmm. So it's a problematic statistic. Sure, fair enough. <laughs> so for each of these, for each of these, uh, they are snapshots that tell us one piece, right? And there are snapshots that will tell us other pieces, and there is nuance and everything else that we won't be able to get into all the details with. However, it's good to know that as prices go up, people are gonna be priced out, and at this point, that estimate is for every 1,266 people um, would not be able to afford it then. Okay, good. Thank you for calling that out, that it's, the numbers aren't always just straightforward. We are not endorsing fake news. We are not endorsing alternative facts. 
and data is tricky, right? So let's let's be mindful of that. All right. Uh, tell me what else. Thank you for starting us off. Go ahead. There's just been a decrease of home building ever since you know the crash that happened in 2007, 2008, and we have not caught up to the demand. Okay. So with the crash. Uh, people got out of the business or the building slowed down or stopped mm -hmm. entirely and it hasn't necessarily <coughs> ramped back up. Yes. So your um, demand is out is outpacing supply? Yes. Okay, thank you. Next, go ahead. My employees who are uh, middle or lower middle income employees uh, are, and renters are being priced out because the rental rental prices property owners are increasing so someone one of my employees in specific was in a home with her family for more than 11 years and was uh, priced out with a rent increase this summer okay. and was homeless for a couple of months before finding another place okay so this is impact um it's impacts um working families folks who have stable income stable jobs um, are are not able to weather those rent increases and and that are at risk for homelessness. Okay, so impacts working families. Um, so with I'm going to capture that with rent increases. Your renters are going to be most vulnerable. Your homeowners probably have steady costs although that's complicated too, but those those renters can't set that price right. and, and they could, okay. So with rent increases. Um, what is the percentage of increase too is one of? Uh-huh. Um, um, so the percentage of increase, let's let's elaborate on that and somebody somebody else can join in too with the, the cost, yeah. I think the, I, I, Another way of saying what Susan trying to say uh -huh. is that rents are going up faster than incomes are. Okay. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> we help each other out here. Um, does anyone have numbers on that? Like, can we call I, I can talk to you about Larimer County in Colorado, but do, do you have specifics? On yeah, I'm sure. So we run the Housing Choice Voucher Section 8 program. Uh, that program $17 million a year. Uh, over 700 landlords, uh, almost all private sector landlords, so the money uh, moves through us to them. Um, we have had uh, over one third of the people in that program, so over a thousand people, uh, receive rent increases in the last year. Uh, average rent increase is $56 per month. So over a third of the people on, what's the program on housing? We call it Section 8. On Section 8, thank you. Um, have had rent increases? Averaging $56 a month. So what that will do for us is um, shrink the program and uh, we'll have to increase our subsidy for families and decrease the number of people. <coughs> the so because there's a limited amount of budget to help with those rents, um, then less people can participate and okay so uh so the the increased costs mean uh can i say the supports don't go as far is that a fair way to kind of paraphrase that so an increased cost reduces the number of people we serve okay <clears throat> i have a question about that so have you asked the private sector landlords why those increases are happening? Yeah, it kind of it kind of differs. Um, we're doing a lot more engagement with landlords. Um, some of them are increasing the rents um, because they want to increase the cap rate because they know they're going to sell the apartment community in the mm -hmm. near term. So that's one. And the other is just market demand. There's um, a lot of people that are interested in renting units, and Section Eight has a cap on how much we will pay. There's probably a bunch more, and I could certainly come back with more specifics. So, so I, if, if I could just add on to that, I, my mom got a letter this, this summer, and it was increasing the rate over $100 a month, and it was bringing us to the market done. That's how much they could get. And that's what the letter said. She got a rate because she's lived there for 10 years. So it's, it was very surprised. Rate hike for 
occurred. So landlords um, raise rents to keep up with uh, market value. Insurance and all this stuff keeps rising. That's what I was going to say. I think people cost uh, yeah. taxes, insurance, uh, maintenance on these are. We own, we own rentals and apartment projects, and, and uh, our costs have gone up significantly. Um, but I think the one thing that people should understand that in order to get a loan on, a, on an income property, you have to show in your pro forma a rate of return of at least six to six and a half percent in order to even get financing for these projects. So if you cannot show that in your pro forma, you will not get financing to build that income property. So there's, there's some there's some math here that's really important to the to the equation of building affordable housing. So help help me make sure I capture that. So to get a to get a loan, to get the money to buy or build or whatever else, you have to demonstrate a certain return. A certain return on, on uh, an ROI, basically return on your investment. Um, and, and obviously, you can play with those numbers, but the other issue to that is sometimes you have to put more skin in the game or a lot more cash into it in, in order to get that, that loan to be able to finance it, so. Um. And, and to be clear, you know, I was communicating factual information. I wasn't right. saying it in a judgmental way. Right, I mean, yeah. The, yeah. Well, I, was just, I was more curious I mean, yeah. than anything else. No. And, and this is a perfect example of, of where rates are going, you know, rents are going up and those prices are hard and they have that impact and here are some of the things that go into that, right, that explain why that's happening, Correct. right? Perfect okay. example of both of those things are true and that was a really amicable <laughs> exchange of that. We might get into harder and harder things and I hope we maintain that same level of like, well, help me understand this and let me, you know, explain it and whatever else. Um, who, is, who have I not heard from at the, start, start there and then we'll keep going around. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so I wanted to double back to two items from the first sheet and how they intersect. So talking about first time home buyers and then talking about rents relative to incomes, I want to point out that uh, first time home buyers, largely in my generation, have some other economic factors that impact uh, effective incomes even beyond absolute, uh, particularly the drastically increased levels of student loan debt versus prior generations. So my wife and I, we had been with a two in, dual income family, no kids, this, in the circumstances where you'd expect where you'd be saving, really because of both of us having student loans, weren't able to put almost anything into savings. It was all going back out to pay, try to get that debt paid down a little, which meant about two years ago when we got a no cause eviction because our landlord wanted to sell the house because the market was starting to improve and they were, we, <laughs> they gave us 60 days notice uh, and we thought for at least for about a month that we were going to end up homeless and fortunately we were privileged enough my dad was able to help us out with the down payment and we're actually homeowners now uh, that's not how that story ends for most people in that situation mm -hmm. yeah so i captured first time buyers have income expenses savings a financial outlook, <laughs> I capture all that, mm -hmm. um, that are different maybe from past generations. Um, just statistically, the numbers look different now, and, and you called out student loan debt as a specific piece yeah, of that. I don't have numbers off the top of my head on student loan debt. Uh -huh. There's plenty of uh, sources out there to show how much, how much uh, heavier of a burden that is now than it used to be. Yep. So is a significant uh, cost, is kind of a non-negotiable, and um, some buyers and capture have, um, I'm gonna say, just family help um, to purchase. But you said that's not the reality for many people, right? It does seem like to me that it's the down payment that is a stumbling block because you probably pay more in rent. The mortgage came up pretty similar. That was an easy enough transition once we were able to make the down payment, but we means my dad. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. And next to you, I'm sorry, I don't know all your names yet. It's okay. Um, so along with that, I think that um, the recession was, for, for people in poverty, people who were already in poverty, it was much more challenging for them 
to get out of, to, to actually um, feel the effects of the, the economy turning around as much. And so along with that is the first and last and coming up with all of those costs to get into um, housing that is just very challenging for them to come up with. Okay. But I think the recession is still, just, we didn't recover all in the same way. Many families Okay, good. So the recession and the subsequent economic <coughs> improvement is, is still impacting people. There's still those ripple effects. I love all these hands. Um, go here. One, two. I'm going to give you a number, and then you don't have to keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, kind of piggybacking on the, uh, on the landlord thing and uh, what you just said about the recession, is that also a lot of landlords in this town are they there maybe three or four houses that they managed to pick up over the years and there was a when the, the economy crashed they really couldn't charge the rents or they they don't want to increase like the ones i talked to in my neighborhood they really don't want to increase rents but their marginal properties those houses are falling apart basically they need to be maintained and so it's a lot of deferred maintenance and so you have that combination of them having to raise those rents in order to take care, in order to bring it up to somewhere they can afford to maintain those properties. The problem is a lot of them are gonna look at that, they're gonna raise rents and they're gonna put it on the market and someone's gonna buy it and then it's not gonna be used as a rental, someone's gonna move into it. And we've lost quite a lot of rental property. We're starting to lose rental properties in our neighborhood um, that are rolling into uh, owner-occupied. Okay. Because they're affordable. So, so like, are you so uh, are, you're saying a rental that's been kind of run down will be relatively affordable, but it takes it off of the rental market then? Right. Well, it's deferred. The, the reason for the, that uh, rents are increasing is that they haven't increased in the past for a long time, and there's a lot of deferred maintenance costs from the again it's the hangover from the recession. Well, they couldn't do anything with those properties, and now you have to. You know, things have to be replaced. Okay. So part of it is weathering those lean times when you, you couldn't, it wouldn't rent if it was uh, was too expensive. Um, there's the deferred maintenance that's kind of maybe become a backlog. Um, <coughs> so are you, is I want to capture. There's a second part to that. Then the properties, uh, properties with that backlog of maintenance are then often being sold, or once well, they do, well, those are your options. Raise rent to maintain those properties, or you can sell them. And a lot of those people who own those properties are older, and they're looking to unload them, and it's, they're taken off the market. I mean, really, most of this problem is all a hangover from the recession. Most of what we're facing here is, you know, the residuals from that event. Uh huh. So these these ones at the backlog of maintenance um, can be fixed, which could raise to an increase in rent to help recoup those costs or sold and then um, not available for rent anymore. Good. Excellent. Uh, who is number two? I'm not remembering anymore so I'm just calling numbers. <laughs> um, so I kind of had two additional groups that I think were being affected. I yep. think one is anyone who's not in the right housing now. What does so, that mean? What does that mean? Um, their house is too big, their house is too small, their house is in the wrong place. They don't have the option to find something that fits their lifestyle better because there just isn't the availability out there and what is out there isn't something they can afford. Um, so they might feel trapped, yeah. and like they have something, but they can't, it doesn't necessarily work to just sell them and buy something new because they couldn't necessarily afford to sell something new. Or, or something different, I would uh -huh. say, rather than new. Because okay, right, right, right. right. New. Um, and then I think the other piece kind of falling off of that is that someone who's buying a property with a lot of deferred maintenance because that's the only thing they can afford now has a lot of deferred maintenance which may not be a cost that they were expecting right. or are equipped to deal with. Right. Mm -hmm. So purchasing, uh, can I, can, is it fair to call it a rundown home? Nationally yeah. occurring affordable housing. What's that? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a stock of housing we have not enough of and among all of the types of housing. That we but then have. it's also not really affordable because then you're all of a sudden you've got to replace the roof, you've got to do this thing, and you're yeah, expecting yeah. to pay this, and now you're paying. Good. So people who maybe get excited about homeownership and are like, great, I found my sister <laughs> just 
<laughs> I can buy, I can afford this house. All of a sudden they have this tremendous cost they weren't expecting of a roof, this literally happened to her, uh, and, and whatever other deferred maintenance. So purchasing marginal housing stock, is that a fair naturally can, can I just clarify something though? I know I'm out of turn here, but one thing on this, you gotta understand again how banks loan on these things. If you can't get an inspection mm -hmm. that is a clear inspection on that, you cannot get bank financing for these homes. So you buy an as-is structure, and usually that has to be like family money or some other form of money. Okay. So it's not conventional financing. So okay. it, it, you I, know, pur purchasing something that's run down is... I, I think there's a scale of run down, right? Like there's <laughs> right. like, you need to replace a roof right now because it has a leak in it, mm -hmm. and then there's the like, wow, all these things had about two years left on their life, and the bank was willing to loan because they have two years left on their life. Yeah, so again, great example where both of those are true. If it's, if it's really bad, no bank is gonna finance it, but there's other, there's the, yeah. the scale, okay? So purchasing marginal housing stock creates challenges for um, catching up um, with repairs and the cost of that. Was there a second point or was that? Oh, the first one was That was it, okay, one. perfect, thank you. Uh, number three. That's me. Um, write down on the post-it note so you don't forget if you're like number seven or eight or whatever. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm um, what was I gonna uh, say? Okay. So, mine is a little over here and I'm thinking about mm. um, com community concepts and ways we think about housing. So a first time, you know, our first home. Why do we have just these, you know, very tight ideas of what a house has to look like? It has to have two garages, it has to have three bedrooms, it has to have two baths, it has to have a big utility room. Where is the thinking that people can adjust, they can live in a home of their own that isn't necessarily fits all those criteria? and the allowances around building codes to build those kind of homes so people can afford a home. Okay, so I'm gonna capture, we have these cultural norms about what housing should look like and that those norms um, affect the building. I mean, you know. Yep, they and they're, they're codified support. into mm -hmm. different, you're talking about the bureaucracy, that they're codified into different rules and regulations that, that then mm -hmm. put limits on those things. Um, into codes, and this is where, oops, codes. <laughs> um, into, into codes and on housing options. Okay, good. Have y'all seen in, a, this is a total aside, but I think it's in Japan, they have those like pods. Mm -hmm. that like, you just go in and sleep, mm -hmm. that's all you need. I think it's more of a hotel idea, but maybe, I don't know. I would have a hard time living in a pod. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting, like, whoa, it, it really changes the shape of, of what you might need. Oh, I wanted to call out. We had a couple folks um, that joined us at the break or just a little bit before. Um, I'm not going to have them check in right now, but I know we have Regina and Eric. Eric thank you. Um, had different things earlier in the evening and were able to join us now. Um, we'll have them check in next time, and I just invite you guys to chime in at whatever point, and we're super glad you're here. So thank you. Anybody else that I missed that joined in? Okay, number four, thank well, you. I, I would like to throw at this from a different direction. We're, we're coming up with all these problems. What can government, you know, say Eugene, do to correct these problems? That's happening at the next meeting. Well, Help me understand the problem the, first. The thing I'm saying <laughs> is that I don't know that government can do ah, anything. Ah, ah. So there are, challenge, or there are limits to what government can do. Yeah. And we can debate whether what government should do, right, and the role of government in big or small or whatever else, but there's also just logistical constraints of what government can do, right? Good, great point, thank you. Uh, number five? Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the math piece because everything we talk about here is related to affordability. And affordability uh, is kind of a, a broad spectrum conversation but in the Eugene Springfield area our median income is about forty three to forty five thousand dollars a year depending upon what report you look at 
if you use the one third percent or one third rule for housing, that means that uh, the typical person who's on the median uh, line can only afford about 150 to 190 thousand dollar house. The challenge is that with our available land supply, the average cost of a lot now in Eugene is about $110,000. Okay, hang on, hang on, I'm not keeping up. Uh, so the average, average median income in this area is forty three to 45000 If a third of your income is going to housing, which is a threshold to keep the rest of you afloat, um, what's the amount you can afford? About, about $150,000 to $190,000 for most people. So, and so a third would be uh, like five hundred. dollars no. Is there a monthly cost? I'm no, sorry. I'm talking about the total cost of the home. Ah, got the it. Total cost of the home. So, so they could afford they could afford something that's between 150. Let, let's say 200,000, just to, just as a as a fair number. So the challenge is is our, our uh, land cost has gotten so uh, skewed. Um, so in the in the construction world, when we build speculative housing. Uh, most of the time, we're, we're looking at a 25% rule for the land value versus the total sales price. So if you have, let's just, for round numbers, let's say you have a $100,000 lot. That means your house has to be $400,000 to actually probably pencil for the developer or the contractor. Okay, I mean, good. So, so the cost of land, I'm just, you, this is really rich and I wanna make sure I get it right. So the cost of land versus the total price um, for it to pencil out as an as an economic decision and for banks to finance it and all of that should be what for sort what well usually t we use the twenty five percent rule the land value is about twenty five percent of the total cost it's just a rule of thumb it's not a hard and set because certain neighborhoods you know if you if you look at the higher end neighborhoods Ferry Street Bridge uh, East University um, some areas in South Eugene the land cost can be even much greater than that. I, I've seen dumpy little houses in Jefferson West Side sell for two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollars that are close to being tear down houses. Mm -hmm. So it's um, so what we have here is is uh, issue of again a lack of affordable land to build housing on. Okay. So you have to uh, to to make that investment worthwhile. You have to build a a bigger, nicer, more expensive house to justify the expense of land, which is high. Correct. And, and I want to go back to Deborah's comment over here. You know, she made a really good point. How, housing types have changed, and, and we are changing them very rapidly. Uh, smaller houses are much more uh, in favor these days, but again, the cost per square foot goes up significantly in a smaller footprint home. And so the challenge is, again, it, where fees, you know, city fees, land costs, all these pressures together to create different forms of housing become much more challenging and much more expensive. And so um, builders who build what we call formula housing in the industry, they have a formula where they know they can that turn a reasonable uh, re uh, profit on that particular product. And so we have to be really careful about defining, you know, where that spectrum of affordability is because honestly, we don't have affordability in this town, period, you know, for most most of the, you know, spectrum of, of uh, people, you know, so. So I captured that housing is becoming more diversified, but there are some of these, like, fixed costs that in the end it still has to, has well, to for, pencil out if you're buying. I'll give you an example. SDCs and permit fees on a 3,000 or 3,500 square foot house can be over $30,000. On a 1,200 square foot house, it's about $23,000. So there's not a proportional difference in just in, in the fees. Okay. So, so an SDC systems development systems charge. Development charge and they've doubled. Of course. The, the, last the systems years. development charge. Everybody knows that acronym. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I did a project with the Forest Service a couple of years back and I had to make an entire dictionary of acronyms. So all right, so this what is it again? S S systems development charge. Systems development charge and the permit fees. Um, those are, are relatively fixed costs. They may vary a little bit depending on what you're building, but there's a certain kind of base level to them that are, are high. And, and increasing? Very good. They've been increasing almost tripled in, since the recession. Would you say those numbers again? 18 to 20,000 for a single family home. 15 to 20,000. That's for a moderate size house. Yes. So. 3,000 square feet. Oh no, 3,000 square feet would be over $30,000. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, 
All right, so you can get all kinds of creative, but those those costs are, are going to be there even if it's a, a smaller home. Correct. Okay. Good. Uh, you were number five, yeah. number six. That's me. And I, the highest number I've got to is way seven. 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 Are you eight? Eight, and then nine, and a ten, and an eleven, <laughs> and a twelve. Well, you just you can't call out all numbers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, six. Is that right? Six. Even if we find a way to reduce cost of housing and the price that's charged for the housing. There's a segment of the population in this town and in every town in the United States that's not ever going to be able to pay market rents. Um, and it may be because they don't have income or maybe because they need social services attached to the housing. And we don't know how to pay for those social services. So the problem is we need subsidy if we're going to serve that kind of population. Um, and we also need flexibility for things like Dan Bryant's Opportunity Village or campgrounds, which in which people essentially sleep in pods, like you described in Japan. Uh -huh. Okay, so so some people will always struggle to make rent. There's there's no utopia. They're never going to be able to be served by the rent. Okay, so these will always need um, subsidies. And to do that, we need money. There was just equal money. Yep. Good. And we also need flexibility for housing types such as the urban campground, the community sports shelters, and Dan Bryant are doing. So flexible housing types can um, help serve some of that uh, population. I would say it can serve all the population, but, but you're specifically so calling that's out a for big, That's going to be a big stretch for the community. We're talking about people living in tents. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to say flexible housing types can meet some needs. And this is a perfect place where we get back to, we want people to be housed, we want people to be safe, we want to write all of these things, and right then there's other trade-offs that the community has to wrestle with. All right, you were number six, number seven. I'm number seven. Oh, with the oh, voice. Oh, okay, uh, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm, this is a big deal for me. I have a daughter who doesn't hear very well, and I know that there are folks that don't feel comfortable saying I can't hear, I beg everybody to use the microphone, please. Did you um, raise your hand to be a number just for that? No. <laughs> you no. Interrupted me. No, totally. <laughs> um, I'm going to pass the microphone to number eight, and then that person is responsible for passing it from there after. That's a good system. There you go. But I did have a comment. Please. Um, and it's just to give some scale to the numbers that, of people in our community. So our population within the urban growth boundary is about 184,000 people. Roughly half of them are renters. So 184,000 in urban growth boundary. Look, I just made my own acronym. Uh, oh, we use them. Roughly 50% are renters. So that's about 92,000. And these are probably out of date, but housing cost burden numbers. Uh, so people paying more than 30% of their housing costs or their income on housing. 61% of renters. That's over 56,000 people in the Eugene area, and 28% of owners, over 25,000 people. And could you explain the cost burden? I, I know what that means because I've been studying up, but just in case, <laughs> what that housing cost burden, just clarify again. Say again. Uh, people who spend more than 30% of their income on housing and utility costs have a housing cost burden. And there's lots more statistics that Stephanie Jennings would be able to chime in about. Um, there's another level of severe cost burden and those folks spend more than 50% of their income on housing and we and Corvallis lead the state in those statistics. So Eugene and Corvallis, that's a bummer place to be number one, huh? Yeah. Do you fight over who gets to be number one and number two? Uh -huh. no. <laughs> number okay. So, but but Corvallis and Eugene are uh, the. What did you say? The uh, I was teasing, and now I just number one people. and two in severe housing costs for severe in, in the state. Yes. All right, number nine, and Terry, you're going to pass the. Actually, it's number eight. eight. Number eight. Sorry, and Terry's going to pass it to number nine. Number nine, nine passes. Number nine, oh, who's number? Who's no, I did. I passed it. But here's number okay. eight. Just leapfrog. <laughs> okay, even though I enjoy the opportunity to use Airbnb when I'm out of town, 
to have a comfortable place to stay with my family, I realized that it also has a huge impact in the city as far as inventory where landlords have shifted their rental places to Airbnb, which is put even that much more of a damper on the availability of rental housing. So I'm going to say short-term rental market, uh, just to be general, but we're talking Airbnb or any of those other VRBO or whatever, mm -hmm. um, decreases inventory. Um, and there's, uh, it's profitable for folks, right? Landlords. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell y'all, I'm staying in an Airbnb now, and as I like hit purchase, I was like, I know this is part of the problem, and I feel so conflicted. <laughs> and it made sense, right? So good, uh, guilty as charged, and I was so mindful that that's a part of the problem. Thank you, it good is. point. Was there another one you wanted to make? No, I just wanted to hear you confess. I do, <laughs> I, did. I was like, should I stay in a hotel? <laughs> and it's a trade-off, right? Because we appreciate putting money directly into the pockets of residents, hopefully, that are, are here and, and uh, we drives up know, costs. I, I know people that have uh, cleaning businesses and they're flourishing <coughs> right. because they have the availability to be cleaning houses every four or five days. Right. So there are economic benefits to the, to the above as well. All right, who is number 10? Nine. Nine? Nine. 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 Who's going to get the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> to number 11. <laughs> or 10. Uh, oh. I, I think that, so it, this is part of strong economy, increasing interest rates. I mean, that's one thing, a really quick thing we can put on there. But, and I think this may have already been captured plenty before, but I'm wondering if we are um, actually building the houses that people need. Um, so, whether or not that is incentivizing it enough um, to build houses, like you know, aging population don't need big giant houses, we need smaller houses, put myself in there. Um, and so that is, that's something that I've, I've, I've been wondering about for a long time as I see really big developments going in with really big, just really big houses. So there's um, there's the market forces in this that some people must be needing those, but other people are are not able to find the houses that they need. Well, and you know, it, and I think it goes along with you know a little bit about what you were saying and, and Deborah, what you were saying as well is that I mean, our, I think people are buying what's available and what's livable for them, but I also wonder if we were building two bedroom, two bath houses for older folks who are downsizing, whether or not those would go like hotcakes, but it doesn't sound like it's very incentivized to actually build those kinds of houses sometimes. Okay. Uh, so people are buying what's available and livable, but they might uh, prefer something else? Mm -hmm. And that those things just aren't available? <coughs> not being built. Okay. Yeah. All right, who's next? I think I'm next. What number are you again? I'm number 10. Thank you. I was seven, it's quiet. You're the one with us. Okay. Um, I, this is really continuing on the point that you just made because I think it, talking about the who is impacted and how they're impacted, I think we can say the who that is impacted is the majority of this community. We're not talking about small slices of this community, we're talking about the majority of people who live and work here and are trying to invest for the long term in this community and find stability in this community. That's really important because that's a different conversation than one that is stigmatized or that uh, creates a lot of haves and has not, have nots. And uh, in the conversations that Better Housing Together has been trying to have in this past year, um, we've been wanting to have a lot of com conversations about the, the we um, and really understanding what it means for the, the we to be facing this crisis. So the who is the majority, um, and the how does connect to, if, if we're wanting to impact 
um, I mean, affordability and diversity and supply of housing, those connect to creating a community that is more open and opportunity rich for everyone. Mm -hmm. And the how impact when housing is unaffordable and people are experiencing instability or can't find housing that actually suits their family and their lifestyle, it uh, turns off the spigot on many other opportunities and on many other issues in this community that we would like to see progress against. And the one I'm thinking specifically about is just family stability and um, stability of children in the community. And that housing affordability is a really important part of that, not just for families at the edge of homelessness or transitioning out of homelessness, but for working families and for families well into what we traditionally have thought about the middle class. So it's a far-reaching challenge that we're facing, and um, it's really important that we see it as a <coughs> nearly everyone. I'll say as an asterisk to that, that as a um, relatively secure homeowner, I benefit from the lack of housing supply in this community. Tell me more about that. Um, we bought our house uh, after you know renting um, for a number of years in this community at the bottom of the market. It had been owned for almost 60 years by a family that deferred all of the maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I are architects. We take on these projects, but um, it amazes me when I see what our home is valued at relative to what we purchased it for. Um, and also I know that we need uh, many more options for families like mine. I don't know if we would have chosen our house if we had had many other choices. We had almost none, which is astonishing, um, at the bottom of, of the market. So I just want to offer that, because I think, um, sorry, this is the last thing I'll say about it. It's also easy to think that while you benefit from the lack of supply of housing, that somehow by working on solving this problem, you will be you know, financially ruined or lose a lot of value. But most of the work we have to do is, um, is stemming the tide and, and creating opportunities from, from where we work right now. It's, it's not as though people who are current homeowners are, are going to you know, radically lose value in their homes by trying to increase um, housing diversity and supply. So creating more opportunities um, does not equal wrecking the housing market for others? <laughs> Way more succinct, thank you. Well, that's because I can't keep up otherwise. Um, you're going to pass it to 12 and number 11. On number 11, a uh, couple of points. One is that I agree with Karen's point that the housing crisis is affecting the vast majority of people in Eugene, um, but it's not affecting everybody equally. Um, and so the city of Eugene has done a lot of research about the housing stock that we have in the city and also about the um, income quintiles in the city. And so we know, for example, that the biggest deficit in inventory is for the bottom quintile of the income brackets. And these are families that can afford $600 or less a month in rent. So building housing for that population is a very unique challenge. And I think, Stephanie, remind me of the number, we're short like 17,000 units for that population. 17, that close to 17,000 units. In which income, sorry? The bottom, in, the bottom 20%. Okay. So the biggest, there's the biggest gap uh, to bring a shortage. Yeah. Okay. So what it looks. Get that number out there. Okay. So the there's the biggest shortage for the bottom 20% of income earners. Yep, and they can afford $600 a month or less in rent. <coughs> Based on that one third rule that we talked about earlier. So there's just not, there's the biggest gap, there's just not inventory that's in, within that range that that, that that group can afford. And creating inventory in that range is really challenging. And Tell me more about that piece, or, or somebody else can chime in. The well, it, it's a similar economics problem to what we were talking about with home ownership, but essentially you pay for land and labor and materials, and it's really difficult to build units that can rent for that, or that can sell for what people at you know below median can afford. So it's it's a similar economics problem, which same inputs go into building housing, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to call out um, back on the ownership front, um, because that's something that Medco cares a lot about, is that um, for 
some land use reasons, some legal reasons, um, the really the <coughs> opportunity for ownership that we have in meaningful numbers in our community is traditional single family house. The only opportunity for what? For, for ownership okay. is traditional single family housing. There are challenges to condos. Um, there are challenges if you want to own um, half of a duplex, if you want to own a unit in a fourplex, if you want to own a condo downtown, if you want to own um, into a co-op where you actually only want a single room and a little kitchenette, and, but you want to own it, you don't want to rent it because you want to build assets. Um, there just are not opportunities that look different than a single family house on a lot. And that's because of uh, the financing mechanisms, because of just the whole legal mechanisms of how our property works. Could you make it really that. simple and easy to spell? We know. Spell? We're zoning. <laughs> <laughs> There's no zoning to allow for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's no zoning to allow for that. There's very, very little percentage of our available land that allows for the right. solutions Emily was describing. And if you want to condo as a project, it's prohibitively expensive for everybody involved, and so it only makes sense if you're building many, many units at a time. So you're not going to you're not going to condo a fourplex, right? That's not interesting. Yeah. Um, there are other legal challenges, but let's leave it there. So there's little there's little zoning that allows for that, in addition to a bunch of other things, mm -hmm. but for more diverse options. Okay, good. You were number 11. Number 12, and she's passing it to 13. Number 12, yes, sir. Uh, this has been mentioned with a lot of other comments, but I just wanted to make it really clear that the housing that our community desperately needs no longer pencils. You can't make a profit building it, so it's not being built. So the housing we need, you say it doesn't pencil, meaning that the financial There's side no of it. There's no profit in building it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, no incentive. Alright, so when we talk about limited inventory, it's not being built because the, the numbers don't pencil out. It make Nobody's going to take on that kind of liability if they can't make a profit doing okay. it. Good, thank you. Uh, number 12? 13? Um, so I'm going to switch gears here. I'm going to talk about retention and recruitment. So, you know, would a brilliant student who graduates from the U of O be able to afford housing if they want to graduate here and keep that talent inside the city of Eugene and contribute to our community? Or if there's a job opportunity that's available in Eugene, can a family afford housing to actually be recruited here to contribute to a business in our city? Um, also, uh, we kind of mentioned this beforehand, but also this is kind of changing gears again, but um, just different phases of life for, for first time home buyers. Uh, we were going up against people who were trying to downsize in terms of our affordability, which made the, the, a very challenging process to even um, put, an, you know, to put a down payment down on a house to have an offer considered. Um, so that is just so let me clarify, there's stiff competition between like first time home buyers, is that what you're And downsizing. And downsizing. Mm -hmm. Because the downsizing is oh. downsizing. Yeah, they have to buy a small home. Adding to that, which it makes this a little more complex, when we would get, uh, when we put an, off an offers and a downsizer would win the offer, we would actually have to go and rent, which takes away opportunity for someone to rent that apartment and the cycle just continues. Mm -hmm. So the first timers get stuck renting and then it has the trickle down effect all the way through. Because they have the money to buy, they're trying to buy, but that, and then it just drives over prices. It is such a wicked problem. All right, remember stay focused on who is this affecting and how. We're gonna talk about some of these further reaching impacts and the way it's affecting people and recruiting talent is a, is a piece of that. Um, but, but keep track of, uh, keep keep those ones aside. Help me understand if there's anything else we need to know about how now. You were 11, are you adding? 13. 13. Y'all, I woke up at five o'clock and math is real hard right now. <laughs> uh, you were 13, number 14, and? Um, well, I think yeah. we got, got done with our numbers. I think we like, oh. reached the end of the numbers. Are well, that I, the I, numbers? I Claudia, did you have your hand? No, you were good. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm just going to turn around really quick. So speaking about who's affected, I think we've all overlooked the disenfranchised in our community. So people who may not speak English or people who may have never lived in a home before or people who have rented before and who have never had that 
uh, mobility or that ladder to home ownership. Um, there's a lot of issues like maybe not speaking English, or maybe having a substance abuse issue, or some sort of um, cognizance issue about being able to overcome that first barrier, just filling out forms and being in a situation where you're purchasing a house. I think that's overlooked a lot of people have just never even had that idea or that dream on the horizon. And I think Emily's organization, Netco, is the perfect organization to provide that mobility to people. Thank you. So I, I captured economic language and disabilities further um, challenge access to the mobility through housing or access to housing? Uh, I think it's the disenfranchise. So the people that have never even envisioned themselves living in a home or they're just comfortable maybe sleeping on someone's couch or getting a whole bunch of people in an apartment. So how do we eliminate those roadblocks? I know a ton of people that work for me that make plenty of money, that live in apartments, or they live with friends, or they have really terrible budgeting, right? <laughs> Some poor choices and poor life. And I don't want to sound glib about everything that we talk about. They're all great ideas, but they all boil down to we need to build cheaper houses and give people more money. There's other roadblocks to this, and there's other economic um, challenges that people have. Um, so speaking to Dan and Ed here, um, we own construction companies starting pay right now for people digging ditches is 17 bucks an hour with full benefits and I can't find people to do that work. So those people can afford houses, but they won't come work for me because they don't want to dig ditches. So what are the barriers to getting those people in our jobs and then how do we provide a path to home ownership for those people that come into those entry level jobs? Hey, I just captured we need cheaper houses and people need more money. <laughs> There's a bunch else that's in there, but does that capture that? Well, that's, again, that's my summary. I don't want to sound glib, but there's other barriers to entry other than money. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we've captured a lot in terms of who's affected and how. Um, are there any other burning ideas that we have not touched on that we need to, to capture? I think we just need to add folks with addiction. Okay. So, it's a huge barrier to so So, having a history of being convicted? Just lunch. Uh huh. I also wanted to add people with transportation limitations um, that can't drive uh, an accessibility to housing where they don't need, where they can uh, get around with it, even if they have some sort of mobility limitation. Okay. Um, so limited transportation kind of further uh, limits folks or further complicates things or further? Uh, cars are expensive. Uh -huh. So that adds to the housing cost if you're having to live somewhere that's way, way further out and you're paying, you know, 50 bucks, 50 bucks a week in gas to get your house. Okay. So in that big picture, the car dependency and the expense, uh, means you have less money to go to housing. And, and if you're someone who can't drive, um, if you can't find an option that is feasible, then you're pretty trapped. Yep. All right, um, one, anybody else? Two, three, and then we're gonna wrap this part up. Go ahead. One. Oh, 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 sorry, I just like walked in the mic here. <laughs> Um, one thing, uh, I got to identify myself as part of the problem, being from California, and having spent all my time as a renter in Santa Cruz, spending at least 50% of my income on rent and utilities as a baseline, and the point was trying to keep it below it, and then the fact that, you know, well, I don't tell you that, you know, the expensive housing down there. But one thing to keep in mind is that this destroys it destroys culture when you drive people to the point where they can't afford it. And it and the amount of stress is just unbelievable when it comes to that, right? It's just that you can't, you can have a full-time job, you can have two full-time jobs. I'm faculty at San Jose State University. I teach online, so I can live up here. We hire faculty, they automatically qualify for low-income housing. Coming on, people with PhDs who are getting these jobs that qualify for low income housing. And that doesn't even count everybody else who's like I did waiting tables or doing anything like that. And when you have that situation in the community, it destroys culture in that community. 
it, it, the amount of stress is just amazing. And I think that there's something that we should realize, and I can tell you, I've had that, we don't want that, and we should be willing to do a lot to avoid that. Um, and this is something that even if you have a house or not, we should be very, very aware of, of the corrosive aspects of people who can't afford, who have to work their butt off and have good full-time jobs and they're sharing a room in a house with five other people. So the, the, the lived experience, and I captured two things there. Um, people coming from more expensive places can enjoy access here, right? And that drives costs up, but it's a, a part of that we could probably talk about. But when people can't afford to live in a, a place, it destroys the culture and it creates that toxic stress. Uh, number two. Ooh, thank you. So, uh, you know, there are many uh, families who have <coughs> care, you know, like uh, house, head of households who are uh, here and they're not documented. And um, they, many of them pay taxes that they will likely not uh, get much benefit from. And uh, they have children who are citizens. And so, uh, these these individuals, um, you don't necessarily see them on the radar when it comes to housing because they're pretty resourceful and they will uh, connect with family and um, that, you know they will double up or do that kind of thing to, uh, to survive. And um, they also uh, aren't able to gain any U.S. identification. Uh, or Oregon identification, which can also be a barrier, uh, you know, for uh, property owners may request that they have some kind of identification. They may not uh, accept that identification that comes from outside of the U.S. So um, those are issues, and um, whether you know how, no matter how you feel about uh, the immigration issue. Uh, it impacts our community. It's uh, it is a, most Latinos. When you talk about the immigrant communities, they are uh, they're from Oregon. They're born in Oregon, so that's also a misconception that just you know if somebody's uh, Spanish speaking that they're they're not from here. So uh, it, it, it's going to impact a lot of families and a lot of our future workers. Yep. Can I tag along? Yeah, please. The, and they also get penalized because they have to pay in order for them to get a loan. They uh, get penalized paying over four to five points above the norm of what the lending is. So if they want to build stay here, they just, it's harder for them to do so as well as the down payment they are required to have. So on top of the other challenges, they're paying higher rates if they're trying to get a loan. That's correct. And there's also a possibility that, just as the last thing is coming up, is there's uh, there is potential that uh, parents or caregivers of kids who are citizens that are receiving benefits, you know, getting support through their child's citizenship, that that may hinder uh, their ability to uh, gain uh, legal status here. Um, it's called public charge, and um, if, uh, if my son, let's say I'm not uh, a citizen here, I'm not, I'm undocumented, if my son is a citizen and I get food stamps through him, uh, the administration is looking at using that as uh, a reason for, uh, well, you, you are a, uh, a public charger, you are a cost to society, basically, and that uh, will rule you out for different kinds of uh, supports. Okay. So families who get support for their, their children who are citizens could be penalized uh, for that support. Uh, number two. So this was touched on once earlier, and I want to thank Karin for that. But if we're going to talk about this overall story of our housing market, we have to revisit that group for whom the market is working well. I think they're a much bigger component of the story than one mention in eight pages. 
and when we start talking about the different interests and how they get prioritized differently by different groups, uh, that segment is going to have a very different prioritization of what matters than all the various segments we've discussed that are having difficulties affording housing. And so I want to make sure that that just got mentioned a second time. So I captured that the, the market is working well for many, and those of us who are secure in the home ownership and seeing those prices rise, that's, that's money in the bank, and there's a disincentive to do something different as we're balancing those tensions. Exactly. We want to talk about who's, where is tradition and consistency and going to be the high priority and affordable prices potentially even seen as a negative. Sure. And in the same ways that, that things need to pencil out if you're going to build something, if you're going to sell the house, very few of us are saying, I'd like to sell my house as inexpensively as possible, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, a, there's not an incentive there. All right, well, I think there was one more. Yeah. And this is kind of a question. Um, there seems to me there has to be an impact on the student population here on the rental market. And I know we have a lot of student housing, but it's very expensive student housing. <laughs> And so students who are incurring all these loans are trying not to pay for their expensive housing and they're competing with the folks here who have low paying jobs. And so um, it just puts a greater tension on that part of the market where we have possibly some lower rents available. Mm -hmm. Good. So the, the university is a big economic driver and all of these wonderful things and that student population is uh, also playing a role in, in the rental costs. Then. Go ahead. So I would also say that the students are <coughs> too. Yeah. And they deserve, and so they're not just an impact on the market, they're someone who's impacted by the market. So. so students live here too. It's not like the others, like, oh gosh darn those students. Uh, yeah. They're the worst house uh, <laughs> um, So the students live here too, and they are also impacted. When you think about student loan debt, Right, that's from students who are taking on loans to pay to get through school. Um, so, and are impacted. Good, I saw one more hand here. You, oh, go ahead, yeah. and then um, you. Okay, I just, um, the whole idea of, uh, of what's going on in our society, uh, especially around families, uh, I know that we have a great uh, uh, increase in the single parent households. Uh, a lot of women, and us, uh, Dominantly raising kids with a single income, and and this is something that our society is creating more and more of. And so I, I just think the whole idea of looking at this as a societal human rights issue, and that uh, what we're seeing tonight is that uh, there's going to have to be some real systematic change. Government's going to have to step up because the money's not there in the private sector. So this whole idea of the of the capital uh, economy. Uh, is really coming to a, a, it's almost coming to a halt. And so I, that, so I think that the story of who and how is going to have to be a, really a systematic uh, a problem that government's going to have to get involved with uh, to help the private se se sector. Uh, because these are uh, societal issues that aren't going away. Uh, and I see here uh, single parents uh, having a big issue finding uh, homes. Thanks for calling that out. So I have the single, the, the how many families are headed by a single parent households, um, which then you just have the one income, typically them contributing, um, and it's a systematic problem. It's not just a private sector problem. All right, y'all just won't let this die. You want to keep talking about that? No, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing here and then here, and I'm hoping this can be the last word. I know. Unless, red, so yes, I know. I know. Um, unless somebody has a really burning one, because I want to keep keep going. Oh, I just feel like a huge skeleton, and I in the in the middle of the room, or the elephant in the middle of the room here. And I think it ties in, we've touched on it a little, but the whole other side of this is unless we have jobs and minimum wages that are creating not just minimum wage, because that's creating a problem. What's livable wage when, like for the state of Oregon, oh, we'll get to $15 an hour, and that's supposed to be great. It doesn't <coughs> function today in order to create livability for someone to afford a house, either to rent or to own. I think the average person would have to work 90 hours a week. And so, therefore, I think, like you were saying, Eric, we, we're coming to a collision 
where the advancement of you know a lot of people making a lot of money versus those that are struggling at the bottom for the various reasons that have been expressed here are going to have to be addressed. I don't think we can address housing unless we address economic disparity. Okay. So this is where um, we want to be mindful of, yes, absolutely true, wage, wage stagnation and what a livable wage is and everything else in the, the broader system is totally a part of the problem. And when we start thinking about options, for this purpose, we need to focus on what can we do, what can the city of Eugene, what can city council do that's going to make an impact, and what can the rest of us do in the rest of our lives to launch the revolution or whatever it's going to take, <laughs> right, to, to work on those things, right? Because city government is going to have one role to play, and there's, there's a broader problem to be solved. Thank you. I appreciate that reminder. All right, last but not least. I don't know that you need to write this up there or not, or whether it's been explicitly stated, but I think there's the fear of who you're asking me to live next to. That is um, something that I feel like hasn't been explicitly stated, but maybe it really has. I'm not sure. I think we've danced around it a little bit in nice ways. Thank you. Uh, so I captured there's a fear of who you're being asked to live next to and there's a uh, there's a bunch of ways that that may look do you want to elaborate just to clarify for people oh, like low-income housing next to a single-family division that's been there for uh, 20 years so it goes back to if we've hit on different parts of it it's that tradition it's that not in my backyard it's lots of different things um, that could be causing that, but I think that there, and we've even mentioned the word fear um, somewhere, but I think that um, it's just who, who you're, who may be moving in mm -hmm. next door to me. Good, good. And to me that comes back to that idea of safety, right, and what, what makes people feel safe, and what we do when we don't feel safe, right, and, and what may prompt certain people to feel safe or unsafe is, is uh, can be really challenging. Excellent. That was really good again I'm so impressed with you all um, let's do this our next phase there is more we could talk for weeks <laughs> there is more but at eight pages um, let's let this one rest for now um, and let's look at our second one the broader impacts however I'm gonna have you do it in a different way than we did before I'm going to ask you that the, the topic is what are the broader impacts we understand part of what it looks like to live this experience. We understand some of those cascading effects, but I want you to think about uh, what are other ways that we may not even recognize that this challenge is affecting people. So let's say I'm secure in my home, I own it, I've seen the property values rise, I'm feeling good. What are ways that this housing affordability problem is maybe negatively impacting me in a way that I'm not even aware of? Okay. You are going to stand up when I say go. You're going to find somebody to talk to that you've never talked to before. Scary, I know. <laughs> you're going to introduce yourself, say I'm so and so, I'm so and so, and you're going to just brainstorm what are a couple ideas, what are ways that this might be impacting people that you're not aware of yet. If you're feeling really lost or really low energy, grab somebody and make a group of three because if two is good, three is better. Don't make a group bigger than three though, because then you're just going to lean on one person. Lazy. Uh, make a group of two or three, stand up, have that quick conversation with them. How is this impacting us? And just turn your attention back this way so I know you're ready. Ah, I've got about half the room ready. Ooh, I've got about three quarters. Awesome. Uh, before I give you your instructions of what you're going to do with this brilliant thinking, I want you to acknowledge this partner, partner, go ahead and look at who you've been working with and repeat after me, say, wow, I thought my last buddy was good. <laughs> All right, here are your instructions, here are your instructions. You just had difficult, rich, deep conversation. I want you to think about just a couple of the highlights and how you can phrase that impact one one per sheet onto a post-it note. So for example, if you are aware that
people driving long distances because they can't afford to live in Eugene, so they live somewhere cheaper. Coburg? Is that it? Coburg's not cheap. <laughs> I don't know, sorry. So they live somewhere more affordable and drive in. That creates more traffic, right? So you could write down traffic. You could even write down traffic plus carbon footprint, if that's something that's important to you, okay? Succinctly, because some of you, I know it's really rich. Succinctly, write down some of those ideas, some of those top ideas, one idea per post-it note. And I'm gonna ask you to deliver that post-it note, post-it notes, those however many you want, to me. Okay, so you can decide, do your best on your handwriting. I used to be a high school teacher, so I'm pretty good, but do your best. <laughs> Jot down the highlights of those ideas, and when you're ready, bring them to me, and then head back to your regular seat. All right, I have 90% of the post-it notes I need, which means I have 90% of the attention I need. We're almost there. Such a hog for attention. All right, I think there might be a couple more trickling in, but I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what's here. Here's what else is going to happen with these. I'm going to transcribe them into something larger like this. <laughs> this will be my fun project for the weekend. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to take these and literally put them on chart paper so the format is the same and you can read them. We will spend time at our next meeting talking more about these um, because we want to make sure that we're understanding them and, and the intentions behind them. Uh, here's another piece to draw your attention to. After this meeting, I take pictures of all of the um, notes and those will be posted online as a PDF. Rather than typing them and everything else, we, we literally will just take pictures of this and um, capture the, the experience in that way. It doesn't work to take pictures of these. <laughs> so that's why I'm going to transcribe them and I'll do my best to do you justice in what you put, but we'll clarify if we need to. I'm going to rifle through just a, a few of these so we get a flavor of them. And this is how we'll start our next meeting. Um, can, Jason, will you help me? <laughs> will you be my microphone stand? <laughs> Jason is such a utility guy. <laughs> All right, so inclusive opportunity. Older and younger generations need opportunities to be stable. So there's a, an instability factor and it's affecting multiple generations. Um, sometimes people oppose things out of misplaced fear. So if they have fear of one thing and then that kind of trickles through other places. The city's willingness to change long-standing notions, rules, and regulations. So some of this is just entrenched and adds to the entrenchment, I believe. Um, changing, changing perceptions of potential or feared harm, i.e. property values of unique and diverse housing options. Okay, so there's a, an element of our cultural awareness and our perceptions of those other options. Um, community receptiveness to unique housing options. So if we always do the same thing, we always only expect the same thing, it perpetuates some of that. We have inequitable outcomes from incentivizing development. So the way things are currently incentivized, we maybe continue to get more of the same. Breakdown of the economic system, speaking to, to some of those uh, larger stresses and how they're all coming to a head. Family stress, marital stress, and the impacts of that on children. Okay? And even if that's not happening in your house, that stressed child is in class with another child, right? And then that's having a trickle effect in the school. School impacts increased disparities in education. Taxes come from homeowners, okay? So because of the way that our school funding is largely tied to property values, et cetera, you have that disparity. Disappearance of the middle class. Stress of worrying about safety nets going away, i.e. food stamps, Section 8, et cetera. Okay, so that, again, that's that stress and the way it trickles through. Lack of cultural diversity because people are driven out of the area inequality or inequity excuse me homeless impacts on the health um, homeless person and its impact on the larger community okay so we recognize the way that this is systematically although we're not just focused on homelessness that it's a part of the larger system and that that has an impact on the rest of the community you need Eugene needs to think different I think that's off topic but ah, take it <laughs> I'm just teasing worry about employees stability able to maintain a workforce okay so if you're a business owner right it matters to you that your employees have stability and that you can count on them worry about children's future and stability intergenerational stress parents worrying about their adult children adult wor adult children worrying about their parents where each of them are gonna live oh nice angle to it increased housing insecurity stresses families and signif significantly and we're seeing the impacts on young children emotionally hearing a lot from our school community of how this is impacting 
um, young people and starter families can't afford to live here. Something. So the community is becoming older? Mm -hmm. Older something and wider. Richer. Uh -huh. Older, richer, and wider. I don't know how many of you woke up said, I only want to work and live in an old, rich, white community today, but I bet that wasn't what you were aiming for. Okay, but if we're driving out younger people, people of color, right, people of different inco income levels, that's a, a effect. Housing security doesn't last or changes. Lack of culture, we talked about the toxicity if people can't stay. NIMBY, not in my backyard. G oh, what is it? Yes in, my yes in my backyard. Ah, thank you. I just saw Imbi. <laughs> thank you for whoever fixed me on that. Uh, geographic mobility, people leave. Um, uh, looking for a better job. Is that what? People can't leave. People can't leave. Excuse me, so they're stuck. Okay, or they can't come. Good, so it limits mobility in both ways. Thank you. Uh, people stuck in affordable housing with no upward mobility options. So again, they're taking spaces from other people who could step into those affordable subsidized units. Um, housing construction versus the environmental impact. Okay. Crime. Okay, this is impacting, could increase crime. Stress for children, homeless sleeping on sidewalks and impact for low level earners. Increased minimum wage, can't afford deposits, they need capital and can't pass background checks. Okay, so we have this, this effect all through the system. Good. Raise your hand if you heard something you hadn't thought of. Raise your hand if you're like, yeah, preach, we know that. <laughs> Good, both of those are hopefully true. Excellent. Um, those, that was an incredibly rich and fast snapshot. My takeaway is, ooh, it's not just the family who is worrying about making rent or trying to buy a home and, and losing on the bidding war to the cash buyer, right? That it uh, has a ripple effect all throughout the community. So next time, we're going to step back and look at those as a way to kind of jog our memories. We'll take a look at these notes, be like, oh, yeah, that's what we were talking about. We'll flush out anything that was missing from those or any other kind of nuance that we want to make sure that we capture. And then we're going to jump into some of the specifics with what are some more of these challenges that to increasing supply. Okay, what are the what are the more what are the reasons why we can't or we haven't yet just built more of these units or whatever else? Okay, that might help that problem because that's a piece of it that we need to understand as a community. Um, and then the, the last piece um, in understanding the story is what we love about Eugene. What are the amazing things that are working great here? Some of them creating challenges for housing affordability, but what are the great things that we love here? And then we want to make sure we preserve going forward, um, which will lead us right into our interests and being creative on our options. All right. So our next steps, just as we're starting to wrap up here, our next steps, I want you to be mindful that those are the topics we're going to talk about next time. To preview, you'll do a little bit more relationship building. I'll have you up and talking to new people a little bit more. Today we let you sit where you like. We'll probably let you sit where you choose next time, but I encourage you to just keep meeting new folks. Okay. Um, we'll continue with our problem solving cycle, capturing the rest of the story, the interests and the options. Um, and then we'll be ready, hopefully, with a big suite of options to get to wrestle with at our November meeting. Right. Any questions in terms of what we've done or where we're going next? All right, so we have two pieces to our closing. One of them, you get to have one word as a takeaway. We're gonna pass the mic again. You get one word as a takeaway from tonight. There's like 35 of you, so the people who go at the end, you're going to have to be creative. It's okay to duplicate. If you had one word as a takeaway from your work this evening, that word be. Jot down a couple on your post-it note in case your first choice gets taken. Eric, are you raising your hand to go first? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> He's a smart man. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start here. We're going to pass the mic. I'll let you guys pass it around until everybody's had a chance. Um, and then our last step will be a, a process evaluation, that we'll, and we'll get you out. So again, just one word, no paragraphs. I'm going to start tisking you if you give me a sentence. One word. What's a takeaway 
from this evening? <laughs> Entrenched. Entrenched. Starting. Starting. Thank you. Intrigued. Hmm. Complex. Yimby. Yimby. <laughs> Did we miss anybody? Audience, I'm sorry. We're going to run out of time. I would love to have you all give me a